Libya has plunged into chaos and lawlessness since the fall of longtime dictator Muammar Gaddafi three years ago. Government authorities virtually disintegrated in almost all parts of the oil rich country. Terrorism and militancy is on the rise. The lawlessness has allowed terrorists to move weapons and fighters easily across borders. The economy of the once rich Arab country is also in shambles. The government lacks the power or apparently the will to act against striking guards and mutinous military units linked to secessionist forces who've occupied oil ports and exporting facilities. So why has Libya descended into chaos? Why is the central government so weak? And why is NATO and the countries that supported its 2011 attack on Libya being blamed? I'm Homalesgi and you're watching The Debate. Concerns are growing in Libya over the government's ability to maintain stability in the country. For many Libyans, the government has no real power. The oil-rich country is facing the threat of disintegration as militia groups are fomenting violence and targeting even diplomats in the North African country. On Monday, a Libyan extremist group released a video of a Tunisian diplomat recently abducted in Tripoli. The footage shows Mohammed bin Sheikh pleading with Tunisian authorities to negotiate with his captors and secure his release. He is one of two officials recently kidnapped from the Tunisian embassy. According to Tunisian sources, the captors are demanding the release of Libyans jailed for their role in a 2011 attack which killed two Tunisian police officers. The abductions were part of a string of attacks on diplomats in Libya. Days ago, Libya's interim prime minister, Abdullah Al Thani, quit his post a week after the government tasked him with forming a new cabinet. Thani said that he and his family are victims of a traitorous armed attack. Thani was the country's defense minister under ousted Premier Ali Zaydan, who lost a no confidence motion in the Libyan parliament in March. The vote of no confidence followed the standoff between the central government in Tripoli and powerful militias in the eastern region of the North African nation. Zaydan's ouster was accelerated by a row over a North Korean flagged vessel that was illegally exporting Libyan crude. The vessel was later seized by the US forces. However, the government was heavily criticized for handling the illegal shipments. Since Gaddafi's fall, Libya has been torn among multiple rival heavily armed militia groups, while the central government has been weak, unable to practice its authority over the country. Meanwhile, clashes over control of the oil-rich east of the country have left many people dead so far. People blame the militiamen and the weak government for the situation. The resulting lawlessness has allowed terrorists to move weapons and fighters easily across borders. Critics of the Western military intervention say the campaign made the situation ripe for the growth of extremist militants, fueling tribal and regional divisions. You're watching the debate. Joining us live from Washington is author and historian Mr. Webster Griffin Tarpley. And with us live from London is the Hello. spokesperson for the Libyan Democratic Party, Mr. Sabri Malik. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for being with us. I'll put my first question to a guest in London. Mr. Malik, why is Libya turning into a failed state? I am the spokesperson of the Democratic Party in Libya, just a correction. Uh, Libya is experiencing difficulties establishing democracy. They are teething problems. We have been under Gaddafi's tyranny for 42 years to expect Libya to establish a true democracy within three years of the fall of Gaddafi is very unrealistic. We are on our way to establish our democracy. We are very glad, very happy that Gaddafi is gone and his, uh, his uh, clique will never come back. Uh, NATO helped us a great deal. We, uh, with the help of NATO, uh, we prevented the use of chemical weapons against Libyan people. Uh, without the, uh, the help of the Americans and NATO, Gaddafi, as he was threatening, would have used chemical weapons against Libyan cities. But Mr. Malik, if I could just jump in here. Of the, the question here is, we, we are agreeing that uh, Muammar Gaddafi was a dictator and people wanted him out. What's being discussed now, if you would please elaborate for us, is why the current government is failing. 
because it is failing because we don't have a culture of democracy in Libya yet. This uh, democracy is very alien to most Muslims. There are very few Muslim countries who are truly democratic. We Libyans are not different. However, we want democracy, we want our freedom, and we need the help of the international community, the United Nations, to help us in this respect. Well, let's bring in Mr. Webster Griffin Tarpley on this as well. Uh, Mr. Tarpley, what do you think has made the central government weak? What is making it incapable of reigning in the militia? I mean, it couldn't even stop a South Korean vessel from carrying away the country's oil. I'm afraid what we have in Libya is a tragic monument to what I would call a criminal policy of destroying modern nation states wherever they exist and whatever their internal constitution might be. Uh, and this is, of course, the, the policy of the State Department and the CIA and the Foreign Office, MI6, the uh, Quai d'Orsay and the DGSE, all were heavily involved of mini-states, micro-states, failed states, warlords, rump states, secessionist movements, and so forth. The goal is to destroy any political unit which is strong enough to say no to the NATO, IMF, International Monetary Fund imperialism. And it's a wanton policy of political vandalism. It takes no account of what might be left uh, after the, uh, the dust has settled, when the bombing has, has ended. Uh, I don't see that there ever was a basis for NATO bombing. The, the story that was told at the time by the American and uh, European networks was that Gaddafi was theoretically going to carry out a massacre in Benghazi. And this was whispered into the ear of Sarkozy by Bernard-Henri Lévy, the so-called philo philosopher, I call him a philodoxer. And of course, here in the United States, uh, perhaps an even more prominent figure, Samantha Power, who is today the face of the United States at the United Nations, a great mm. shame for any uh, American to have this. She convinced Obama that it was time to do the bombing back in March of, uh, of 2011. So what has come out of this now is a centrifugal process where mm -hmm. you've got certainly Tripoli, Tripolitania going one way, you've got uh, Cyrenaica, the, this uh, axis of Tobruk, Benghazi and Derna, they're mm -hmm. going in another direction. You've also got Fezzan and areas in the, in the desert that are going in another direction. I would also point out, L Libya was a factor of stability for the entire Sahara and the entire Sahel, and the stuff that we've seen in Mali, in the Central African Republic, and in other areas, these tragic events, all of them have something to do with the chaos that has, that has seized the, uh, the Libyan part, which had been, a, I think, yes. a big factor of stability. So I think this is absolutely criminal. Well, uh, let's bring Mr. Malik on this as well. Now, Mr. Malik, in 2011, we know NATO uh, launched an attack uh, in Libya and uh, managed to oust uh, and then kill uh, Muammar Gaddafi. And that was supported, of course, by the militia who were against Gaddafi. Now the same militia are responsible for the situation of chaos. Where did NATO go wrong, do you think? Uh, it wasn't NATO who killed Gaddafi. It was us Libyans. Uh, we are very thankful that NATO came to our help in our hour of need. Uh, Libya will become a democracy. Mm. And um, I would say that uh, the Arab Spring is having problems uh, currently. Uh, they are to be expected. But 10 years from now, if we look back, we will see that uh, we, what we are having nowadays is the uh, the beginnings of democracy in the Arab world. Tunisia has done well so far. Libya, we have done well in terms of the old regime has fallen completely, completely collapsed. Egypt are having problems, the return of the old regime. Syria, as you, we all know uh, what's happening in Syria. Yes. But overall, the Arab Spring will succeed. And ultimately, of course, we're going to have democracy in Mecca and Medina, the centers of Islam, because we cannot have democracy in the Muslim world while Mecca and Medina 
remain prisoners to the tyranny of the Ahad Saud. Well, you see, Mr. Malik, if I could just raise a point here, those who are blaming NATO or their NATO's allies here are saying, let's look about the, tr let's rather observe uh, and find out the true intentions of NATO here. They say, for instance, now that Libya is. Uh, in again in an hour of need it's facing a very a volatile situation why is there silence why isn't there enough action by those who went to help uh, Libya before why are these countries not taking any action now we in the Democratic Party called for the UN intervention peacekeeping forces uh, from the UN, UN, UN coming to Libya back in, in, uh, in 2011. We knew that we establishing democracy in Libya would be rather difficult because of the, uh, the tyranny of Gaddafi and its aftermath. Uh, nowadays, uh, the UN is really seriously considering coming to Libya to help us. We need the political and the military help of the, UA, the UN for us to establish democracy. Uh, this, is, uh, this is nothing to be ashamed about. We don't know democracy. Most Muslims don't know democracy. But we want it. And we want our freedom. And yes. the UN will come to our help, inshallah. Uh, Mr. Tarpley, do you think this is about, uh, as I guess put it, a culture of democracy? I, I would see it differently. I, I would certainly sympathize with the wish uh, expressed by my colleague here that uh, Saudi Arabia could become a democratic state. That would be a great thing for the world. And I certainly I sympathize with his hopes for Libya. But I'm afraid uh, Libya is, uh, is, is headed towards this status of microstates, mini states, or, or failed states. It, even on the uh, uh, UN Human Development Index, where Libya had been uh, one of the leading African and Arab states beating out Ukraine and, and some countries in Latin America, it's going down. And I think it's actually gone down much further. I think the UN has uh, cooked the statistics to try to make it look uh, not as bad as it, is, as it is. The fundamental problem you have now is armed gangs. You have a neo-feudal anarchy and chaos. You've had these figures, right? Uh, infamous characters like Bel Hajj, who had been uh, arrested in, uh, in Pakistan, held by the US, former prisoner of war, or Sufyan Kumu, who came back uh, to direct the killing of, uh, of Ambassador Stevens. Of course, he did that in cahoots with, uh, with forces in the uh, American CIA. But these types of warlords now dominate the scene, and they assassinated the head of the military intelligence last year. So the question is, what, what force could put an end to the rule of these, these um, armed gangs. The one thing that I think needs to be perhaps looked at more closely, in the southern part of Libya, there are reports of uh, a kind of a rapprochement mm -hmm. between residual Gaddafi forces, there's no Gaddafi left, and black uh, Africans or black uh, Libyans from Fezzan. We have to remember that the current regime is built on racism built on anti-black racism because of the lynchings and killings mm. of black Africans that were carried out by the Benghazi uh, rebel council because they, they resented the black Africans as somehow being the tokens of Gaddafi's pan-African policies, which in retrospect turned out to have been rather constructive. Well, uh, Mr. Malik, do you think there is a real threat uh, or danger here that uh, Libya could actually break apart. We are hearing uh, a lot about the fact that these militia groups uh, come from different regions and they're involved in clashes. And before anyone can help Libya, it may see itself breaking up. No, Libya will never break up. That's simply because we Libyans don't want it. There are some elements, pro Gaddafi elements, who want Libya to break up, but uh, they are dreaming. It will never happen. We will never allow it. And the world community will never allow it. Libya will not be turned into a Somalia on the Mediterranean. Of course not. Libya is so, is so important. It's our strategic position, our wealth. Uh, Libya will not go the Qaeda way. Libya will become democratic. We, it will become the Switzerland of the Mediterranean. But we need time, and we need international help. 
Well, you, you, I'll just uh, raise something that you uh, pointed to earlier. You referred to the situation in Muslim states, including, for instance, Syria, Iraq, or Egypt, etc. Uh, those involved, as you say, in the Arab Spring, uh, we're not seeing uh, progress as of yet in these uh, countries in terms of, as you say, democracy in them. And, you know, people are saying, well, this shouldn't be viewed as uh, coincidental because they say if we believe that it was uh, the United States or the West or NATO that wanted to, to, to help these countries uh, reach democracy, then why is its allies in the region, non-democratic countries like Saudi Arabia, like the Persian Gulf Arab states, it's merely the interests involved here and they say that the interests here are those of Israel, are those of Saudi Arabia because they want these Muslim states to remain uh, disorderly so that they can maintain the status quo. Do you see that argument as valid? No, I don't. Uh, I'm not here to speak for the United States. The Americans can speak for themselves. But it is the, in the interest of the West that the Arab world become democratic. The uh, Cold War discourse is over now. We are not in the 1960s. We are in the 21st century. And in the 21st century, there will be democracies everywhere. There will be liberalism everywhere. There will be secularism everywhere. And we in Libya are on our way, despite all the problems that you are, you are mentioning, we will make it. Libya will go secular, Libya will go democratic. Well, uh, before I go so to, I guess... so Egypt, of course. Yes. Uh, before I go to, I guess, in Washington, I'm being told that we're going to take a look now at some of the comments that have been posted on our Facebook page. It's, of course, the views expressed by our viewers. We'll take a look and we'll be back. The West wants to weaken every Muslim nation in order to control their natural resources. To achieve this, they create a proxy army in the name of Muslims who are helping and serving them. Shame on them! The West plays a big role in dividing Muslim countries into pieces and then using their resources, especially the US. There's a growing list of countries where this is happening all shared the same evils. Their resources were being used to provide schools, hospitals, municipal infrastructures, and generally for the benefit of their populations. All shared the same fate. Destruction of the infrastructure, fighting between ethnic and religious groups, many deaths, and a complete breakdown of order. Iraq and Libya are two obvious examples. The increasingly progressive Afghanistan of the 70s is an overlooked example. It was U.S. meddling there that allowed the eventual rise of the Taliban. Syria is fighting off a Western-supported war by zealots. Iran and Venezuela need to carefully watch the U.S. and the rest of their evil empire. Some of the views expressed by our commentators on our Facebook page, our viewers there. Uh, I'll go straight to Washington. Mr. Tarpley, uh, you know, a lot of those comments were referring again uh, to the global interests involved here by the United States, etc. Et but I guess in London was saying that, you know, the Cold War discourse is over now and we should allow Libya to go forward and to make progress and that it will. Well, uh, I'm afraid the, uh, the Cold War uh, discourse is, uh, Cold War thinking is alive and well in the Obama administration, as we see in, in Ukraine. Uh, and I, it seems to me that we've come to understand the color revolution, which was something that might have been started in Libya in the beginning of 2011, and the humanitarian bombing responsibility to protect are simply two sides to the same coin. I would also point out the link of Libya to the tragic events in Syria. Uh, I would point everybody to an article by Seymour Hirsch called The, uh, the Red Line and the Rat Line, which is in the London Review of Books of a couple of weeks ago. The Rat Line refers to the idea that the, the terrorist rebels of, of Libya were shipped from Benghazi, Derna, Tobruk to Turkey and then sent into northern uh, Syria, and that is what uh, Ambassador Stevens was doing, right? The only, the only aspect of Libya that gets any attention in the United States is the Benghazi events of September 2012, and that, of course, had to do with uh, the fact that Ambassador Stevens was in Benghazi 
as part of the shipping of fighters and military equipment taken from Gaddafi's uh, deposits, sending that to Turkey. His last meeting was with the Turkish diplomat, and then sending that into northern northern Syria. So there's a uh, it, th these are not. Uh, spontaneous rebellions. They're carefully planned by NATO intelligence with the US, the British, and the French taking the lead. Now, liberalism, it seems to me, is, uh, is finished in, in, in many ways. Liberalism means the conditionalities of the International Monetary Fund. It means austerity, shock therapy, uh, and we're seeing that in, in Ukraine. Um, Countries like, like Libya, right, that had subsidized prices, free education, uh, subsidies to buy cars, to buy yeah. homes and everything, all of that, I believe, has been largely wiped out because that's what the, the International Monetary Fund and Madame Lagarde have, have demanded. And, and, and nobody in the world in his right mind wants that. So I think the, the future is tragic for the moment until a leader or some form of uh, organization reemerges in Libya. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Webster Griffin Tarpley, author and historian with us there live from Washington. I'm afraid we've run out of time. I'd also like to thank our guest in London with the Libyan Democratic Party, Mr. Sabri Malik. Thank you so much, everyone, for staying with us here on another edition of The Debate from Michal Maliski. Until our next programme, it's goodbye.